So several years ago, uh, on staff was uh, myself and uh, Chris Steinbarger and Chad Bodwin. Many of you know them. And we were headed to a conference. And I asked them this question. I said, if you won a million dollars, what would you do with that money? And Pastor Chad said something along the lines of, you know, I would probably feed an orphanage in Africa, something along those lines, right? Well, Chris Steinbarger said, you know, after taxes, a million dollars, not a whole lot of money, which is a very Chris Steinbarger response. And then they said to me, they said, Dan, what would you do with a million dollars? Some of you already know this, but I said, I would buy a hot tub and I wouldn't feel bad about it at all, right? Like I would be the hot tub preacher and I would be okay with that. You know, it's been several years and I have had a hot tub for several years. And as I look back on my answer at that time, I do have to say I was spot on. I was spot on. Hot tubs are fantastic. $10,000 for a hot tub, the other 990000 that can go to an orphanage in Africa. That's okay. But I love hot tubs. Let me ask you a similar question. Not if you won a million dollars, what would you do with it? But something even bigger than that. If the Lord God Almighty appeared to you and said, you have one wish, what do you wish for? What would be your wish? Of course, the one wish you can't make is to wish for more wishes. We all know that is cheating, right? But if you had one wish, what would it be? Would it be for a certain boy or girl to like you and live with you happily ever after? Would it be for enough money to retire and do whatever you want? Maybe it is to be very talented and become famous as a movie star or a professional athlete or musician. Would you maybe ask God for peace in your home or peace in the world? Maybe healing for yourself or for a family member. Maybe for a happier marriage. Maybe to bring a loved one back from the dead. If God were to grant you one wish, what would you wish for? I know this seems like a silly question, like a game children would play, but this actually happened. It happened to a guy named Solomon. God comes to Solomon and he says, ask what I shall give you. Today we get to see Solomon's response. So if you would turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3, I'm sorry, 1 Kings 3. It's in your bulletin, uh, the whole a passage is there in your bulletin again. In the summer, we're covering longer passages. When we get to the fall, we'll have shorter passages in Hebrews. But in 1 Kings chapter 2, uh, King David dies, and God continues to establish his kingdom through Solomon as he eliminates various threats to the kingdom. Now we are in chapter 3, and the kingdom is secure. It is peaceful. And Solomon is starting to reign over Israel. And the Lord appears to Solomon to grant him. One wish. And so let's look at this together. We're going to start by just reading verses 5 and verses 9 through 10. And then we'll come back and read through the entire passage. So 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, and then skip to 9. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. Skip down to verse 9. Here is Solomon's wish. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray as we study this passage today that you would make us wise, that you would grow us in wisdom because this is a great gift that you love to give. And so we come asking for it and receiving it with great joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream, says, what is your one wish? And Solomon's one wish is for wisdom. Now, a little bit ago, I asked you if you had one wish, what would it be? I'm guessing most of you, like me, said hot tub or something else like that, right? Maybe, maybe it was not a hot tub, but I'm guessing it wasn't for wisdom unless you read ahead and you're cheating because you know it's the right answer. Maybe you asked again for, for reconciliation or for peace in the home or for 
a loved one to come back from the dead. Wisdom is what God loves to give. Now, what is wisdom? A simple definition, a two-word definition of wisdom that doesn't come from Webster's Dictionary. It comes from me, so just qualification. Wisdom is knowledge applied. It is knowledge applied. And so we get our knowledge as the people of God from the Word of God, and wisdom is applying that knowledge to unique and tricky situations. And so we're going to look at wisdom today. And we're going to look at three aspects of wisdom. We're going to look at our need for wisdom, God's gift of wisdom, and then the third is a little bit of an edit on the bulletin. The third is the folly of wisdom. So our need for wisdom, God's gift of wisdom, and the folly of wisdom. First, our need for wisdom. Look at verse 1 with me. It says, Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. Solomon's marriage to Pharaoh's daughter was a political move to form an alliance with Egypt, which was a powerhouse. It was a way to keep Egypt from attacking Israel. It was a wise action in the ways of the world, but it was unwise according to the word of the Lord for many reasons. First off, Israel was told not to form an alliance with Egypt. Egypt was a nation that had been opposed to God, who had enslaved God's people. God had delivered them from Egypt. And so in Deuteronomy 17, when there are instructions given to the king of Israel, it says that the king shall not return to Egypt again. They shall have nothing to do with Egypt. And yet now Solomon is forming an alliance with Egypt instead of trusting in the Lord. Solomon's marriage to Pharaoh's daughter was also foolish because Solomon was already married. <laughs> Solomon already had a wife, a woman named Nama. Again, in Deuteronomy 17, as it's giving laws for the king of Israel, it says, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself. And here he is starting to acquire wives for himself. And it goes on and says, lest his heart turn away. You see, one of the big problems with, with, with Solomon marrying this Egyptian wife is that he was marrying someone who did not believe in the Lord God, who did not follow the Lord God, who had not trusted in the Lord God. He's marrying an unbeliever. And this is strictly prohibited in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. God commands us. He says, marry in the Lord. He says, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. For what fellowship has light with darkness? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. If you are a Christian, you are a temple of God. You belong to Jesus. And God commands us, do not marry an unbeliever because they will be a stumbling block in your most important relationship of all, which is your relationship with God. Solomon knew God's word. He knew he was not to marry an unbeliever, and yet he was unwise. He thought in his own wisdom that this would be a good idea to make a treaty with Egypt, but it was not according to the Lord's wisdom. Let's continue verse 2 through 4. Verse 2, the people were sacrificing at the high places. However, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. In these verses, there is a phrase that would have been very cringy to the original Jewish readers, but really doesn't mean much to us. And it's the phrase, high places. See, high places is where the altars were that were spread throughout the country, where people would sacrifice to various idols and various false gods. And what Solomon is doing here is problematic because in Deuteronomy 12, God makes it clear that they are only to worship the Lord in the tent, in the tabernacle, where the Ark of the Covenant is. Even if you look at the life of King David, he never sacrificed in the high places. He always sacrificed at the tabernacle. For it was the temporary dwelling for the Lord until the temple was built. You know, we said that wisdom is knowledge applied or applied knowledge. Again, Solomon knew his Old Testament. 
He knew the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. He knew these things, and yet he thought he knew better. He thought it would be good to go and to worship on these high places, to have a mountaintop experience. Maybe worshiping in the tent seemed old and boring to him, and he wanted something that was more experiential. So this means that worse, Solomon was sacrificing to the Lord and other gods. But at the best, Solomon was sacrificing to the Lord, but in the wrong place. And here's the thing about it. Solomon had great intentions. His heart was in the right place. He was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. Look at verse 3. It says, Solomon loved the Lord, which is a great attribute. He says, walking in the statutes of David his father. That's great. And then this word only. This word only is restricted, saying, except for this part, right? He loved the Lord. He walked in the ways of father as David, except for this. He sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. Proverbs 12 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Solomon thought it was right to worship at these high places, but it was foolish because it was contrary to the word of God. You know, I have these conversations or I hear this on a weekly basis. There are Christians who have said, you know, I really don't need the church anymore. I don't need corporate worship. I don't need to gather together with God's people. I can just go on a hike and I can worship God there. And that is perfectly fine. The only problem is that the Lord actually tells us how we are to worship him, that we are to gather together as the church. The word church is ecclesia, which means assembly, assembling together with God's people. Hebrews 10 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, which is hard to do if you are all by yourself, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. near. And so to summarize, Solomon needs wisdom because he has a divided and a deceitful heart. He loves the Lord, he truly does, but he also loves the ways of the world. He loves the Lord, but he also loves women of different religions. He loves the Lord, but he also loves worshiping on his own terms. He loves the Lord, but he also loves political maneuvering and worldly security. Let me ask you, Christian, do you have a divided and deceitful heart? Do you know what God's word says and still refuse to do it? The answer is yes, just in case you're wondering. We are not wise. We are fools because we think we know better than God. We love the Lord, but we want to do things our way. We love the Lord, but we also love sin. We love the Lord, but we don't want to be made too uncomfortable by God. And it is this, for this reason, because we have divided and deceitful hearts, that we need the knowledge of God's word to know what is right and the wisdom of God to apply it correctly and do what is right. Verse 5, we'll pick up the pace here. Verse 5, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. There's the question. The Lord God Almighty says, What do you want? And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. David kind of did that. But when he didn't, he repented and turned to the Lord. It says, and you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day, just as God had promised in 2 Samuel 7. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. What Solomon is realizing is leadership is difficult. He has been put in a job that is too big for him. To be king of the people of God, to be king of Israel, needs more wisdom than what he has available in and of himself. Verse 8, And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people? And then verse 10, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. 
Solomon's one wish was to be wise, was to grow in wisdom. And this is probably the wisest thing Solomon ever did. Proverbs 4 says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. <laughs> That's the beginning of wisdom, is get wisdom. And what this means is that wise people know that they lack wisdom. And so they get wisdom by asking God for wisdom. I'm curious, do you ask God for wisdom? Or do you lean on your own wisdom? You know, I, I ask my own, myself this own question, like, how much do I lean on my wisdom and how much do I lean on God's wisdom? And I thought to myself, what is a test that will tell me how much I lean on God's wisdom and not my own? And the test is simply this. How many times this past week have I prayed? Have I stopped, I paused, and I prayed to God for wisdom in a specific situation? Sadly, not very much because I don't realize how much wisdom I am, which is foolish, how much, how much wisdom I need, which is foolish. This is what this passage is telling us, that fools think they are wise, but the wise know that they are fools. Fools know, think they are wise, but the wise know that they are fools. Fools think they are wise and never go to God for wisdom, but the wise know they are fools with divided hearts and go to God for wisdom on a continual basis. And so first we see our need of wisdom. Second is God's gift of wisdom. This point will be shorter, I promise. Verse 10, it says, It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this for wisdom. And God said to him, Because you have asked this and not asked for yourself, it was wisdom for the benefit of the kingdom, long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked yourself, understanding, discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. First off, notice where true wisdom comes from. True wisdom does not come from Google, it does not come from AI, it does not come from friends, it does not even come from your parents. It originates with God. And any wisdom you get from the people around you is if it is consistent with the wisdom of God. God delights when Solomon asks for wisdom because wisdom is a treasure that God delights to give away. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom for any situation that you're in, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. You know, we ask the question, if you could ask God for one thing, what would it be? And it's kind of this fairy tale question, right? It's not a fairy tale if you're asking for wisdom. If wisdom is what you want, if wisdom was what you asked for, God promises that he will give it to you. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this verse, James 1, 5, I, I grapple the extent of God's wisdom and the accessibility of it, and I ask myself, why am I not pausing more to ask God for wisdom? Because he promises to give it to us so generously. Our God is not stingy. He loves to give abundantly to his people. And Solomon is proof of that. Later in 2 Chronicles 9, it says, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. All the kings of the earth saw audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. God had granted Solomon the wisdom that he asked for. Solomon wrote much of the wisdom literature in the Old Testament, Proverbs, Songs of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, many Psalms. God gives wisdom. He loves to give wisdom. Verse 13 continues, the Lord speaking to Solomon, I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Again, he calls him to obedience to his commands. Verse 15, And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem with his new godly wisdom and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. Notice, after Solomon is granted wisdom, Solomon worships the Lord where he was supposed to be worshiping the Lord all along. Not on the high places, but where God had prescribed at the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle of the Lord. 
You know, you've probably heard me ask this question before, but I think it's always a good question to ask. What percentage of God's knowledge do you think you know? If you were to put a percentage of how much God knows and how much you know, what would that percentage be? I think an audacious person would say 1%, right? A realistic person would probably say 0.0001% or something like that. So in your 99.9% .9 of not knowing what God knows, wouldn't it be wise of us to ask God for wisdom? Proverbs 2 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. 1 Corinthians 1, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. Proverbs 19, The one who gets wisdom loves life. The one who cherishes understanding will soon prosper. Why are we not asking God for wisdom more? When we have a tricky situation at work, a tough situation with our children, a conflict with a friend, God's wisdom is good and he loves to give it abundantly. So let us ask God for wisdom fervently and frequently. So just to recap, our need for wisdom because of our divided and deceitful hearts, God's gift of wisdom, he delights to give it abundantly to all who ask. Finally, we have the foolishness of wisdom. We now come upon one of the most famous stories in all of the Old Testament. Many of you are probably familiar with it. I was actually introduced to this story through the cartoon DuckTales as a child when they had a bike that two kids were debating whose it was. The other bike was wrecked. And, and so they applied this story. I was like, wow, that's really wise. But this story leaks into even modern day culture. It is such a famous story. And so there's a temptation to kind of tune out. But this is a really valuable show of God's wisdom. Verse 16 starts it this way. Then two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. And so as we read on, what we'll find out is that they have this dispute, this disagreement, and the lower courts couldn't decide it. And so they take it all the way up to the king to decide on this dispute. Now, already we see what seems to be foolish here, right? If you are a king, you're probably saying to prostitutes, I don't have time for you. You aren't worthy of an audience with me. Go figure this out on your own. And yet the wisdom of God is to share his wisdom with all people, no matter how broken, how sinful, or how messed up they are seems foolish that the king would give them an audience, but according to the wisdom of God, he wants to help them. Verse 17 says, the one woman said, oh my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth and we were alone. There was no one else with us in the house. Only we two were in the house. In other words, there are no witnesses to the story that's about to be told. Verse 19, and this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while your servant slept and laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I had born. Verse 22, but the other woman said, no. The living child is mine, and the dead child is yours. The first child, the, sorry, the first said, no, the dead child is yours, and the living child is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. And so they're arguing back and forth, a common case of she said, she said. Verse 23, then the king said, he summarized, the one says, this is my son that is alive, and your son is dead. And the other says, no, but your son is dead, and my son is the living one. This is a tough case. Remember, there are no paternity tests available at this time. There are no eyewitness testimonies to clarify. It is the testimony of one prostitute against the testimony of another prostitute. And so the question is, how do you figure out which mother this child belongs to? Verse 24, and the king said, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Let's pause there. If you're reading this story for the first time, the king's remedy seems cruel. It seems insane. How is he going to administer justice? He's going to cut a child in two? That seems ludicrous. 
It does not seem like wisdom. It seems like words of a foolish madman. It is absurd. It is insane. It is loco. Who in their right mind would tell someone to cut a child in two? And yet what we find out in this passage is that this foolishness of the world is the very wisdom of God. Verse 26. Then the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son, Oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means put him to death. But the other said, He shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Then the king answered and said, Give the living child to the first woman, and by no means put him to death. She is his mother. And then see how the people of God respond. And all Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king. They were amazed. Why? Because they perceived that the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of Solomon, not the wisdom of David, but the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. You know, earlier we quoted 1 Corinthians 1 that said, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The context of this is that there is another tricky legal dilemma. God had promised David that from him would come a king and an everlasting kingdom full of holy and righteous and godly people. The problem is God cannot find any holy, righteous, and godly people because all have sinned against God. And God must punish all of the sin to be just. And so this is a great dilemma. God longs and promises to bring his people into his kingdom. But all people are disqualified from the kingdom because of their sin. And so what is the Lord going to do? How is he going to reconcile us? How is he going to get sinners into his holy and happy and everlasting kingdom? Well, this is where the foolishness of God is wiser than man. God does something that seems absolutely absurd to humanity. In essence, God says, cut my child in two, put him to death that justice might be satisfied. The king's remedy seemed cruel and insane, like the words of a foolish madman, but indeed it was the wisdom of God for our salvation. 1 Corinthians 1 goes on and says, For the word of the cross is folly, it is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. For it pleased God through the folly of what we preach, the cross of Christ, to save those who believe. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The cross is folly to those who are perishing. They accuse God of being abusive or vindictive or ungracious. But to those who are saved, the cross is a monument of the wisdom of God for our salvation. The only way that God could be an un- bring an unrighteous people into a righteous kingdom forever. You see, in every other religion, it is the wisdom of man. And the way that you attain your salvation is through your own good works through your own faith, through your own righteousness. But only God could come up with the gospel. Only he is wise enough to say, you can never do it. I have to do it on your behalf. I will sacrifice my son so that you can live forever. And I will raise him from the dead that you might experience his resurrection. And so how should we as a people of God respond? Just as Israel did in that day, that we would stand in awe of the king, amazed because of his wisdom to do justice and to bring salvation. Friends, you have a decision to make about the cross. There is no neutral ground about the cross. It is either foolishness of a corrupt God, or it is the wisdom of a gracious God who sovereignly planned it for our salvation. Let me end with this. About 15 years ago, there was a commercial on TV. I still remember this commercial. It's one of my favorite commercials. And in this commercial, you see a guy uh, who is probably a monk in ancient days, and he is climbing up this mountain. You see him climbing through rain, you know, through sleet, through sunny times. Like he's climbing up this mountain during through all these conditions. And he gets near the top of the mountain, and there is this stone building. And he walks into this stone building, and he sees 
a single man, probably the head monk or whatever it is. And this single man is facing away from the door. And so you only see the back of this man and he is meditating. And it's obvious that this is like a man of wisdom. And this guy has come and climbed up this mountain to gather this great wisdom. And so the man who climbs the mountain calls out to the man who is meditating. And he asks him, he says, what wisdom do you have for me? And the man responds, don't eat half price sushi and never kick to Devin Hester. That's his response. <laughs> if you don't know, sushi is already sketchy. Half price sushi is even more sketchy. Never eat half price sushi and never kick to Devin Hester, who is the greatest punt return man of all time. Yes, he played for the Bears. It pains me to say something nice about the Bears, but he played for the Bears. And so he says, never eat half price sushi and never kick to Devin Hester. This is the wisdom he had to give to this man. And he turns around and walks away. Here's the point. You don't have to climb a mountain to get divine wisdom. And you can get divine wisdom anywhere. And you can get wisdom that, that means something. You can get wisdom when you're driving in your car, when you call out to God, when you are walking down the street. You can even get wisdom from God when you are sitting in a church parking lot on Sunday morning. Again, James 1.5 says, If anyone... Lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. I'm guessing today you need wisdom. I know today you need wisdom. I know I need wisdom. And so I actually want to take a moment to give you the time to pray to God, to ask God for wisdom. Maybe you need wisdom on how to spend or not spend your money, how to love a hurting family, how to parent a child or a spouse or love a spouse, maybe wisdom on how to reconcile a relationship or what your next steps are in life, whatever it is. I want to give you a few moments this morning just to sit and to talk to God who loves to give wisdom generously to all. If I could have Janelle come forward, she'll play some music. We'll spend some time in prayer, and I'll close this in prayer in just a few minutes. Take some time in your heart to pray to the Lord and ask for wisdom in the areas that you need it. Lord God, we come this morning confessing that we need your wisdom. And we come confessing that we don't come to you for wisdom nearly enough. But we need your wisdom because we have divided and deceitful hearts. We know your word and yet we try to find the loopholes because we want to do things our ways. We are foolish people, Lord, who need your wisdom. And we're so thankful that you love to give wisdom to those who come and ask for it, that you give generously to all without reproach. And Lord God, we pray that you would help us to listen to your wisdom, which is foolishness to the world, but is life to the fullest. Help us not only to hear your word, but to be doers of your word, to take what we know of your scriptures, to take 
what we know of your character and to be wise in applying it to everyday life, whether it be our parenting, our neighboring, our working, or whatever we are doing. Help us to walk in wisdom, in your wisdom, for our good, for the benefit of our community, and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we